the great uh, questions, I suppose, as we begin this morning, uh, referring to men's philosophy down through century upon century, goes clear back uh, for thousands of years before Christ ever walked the earth in his earthly ministry. Where did I come from? Where am I going to when I die? And the biggie, if you want to look at it, they, what is the purpose of my life while I'm here? I mean, is it all coincidence? Uh, you know, uh, what, what, what's the point? And people have wrestled with those questions, okay? Uh, and they have come up with some real problems when you try to come to a resolution of those questions without including God. You know, if it's all evolutionary, if it's all of men, if it's all a natural uh, situation where chaos reigns supreme, uh, the, the answers are completely dissatisfying at the very best. You know, and totally nonsensical probably would be more realistic. Uh, they fall short of providing anything re remotely realistic uh, to answering those questions, you know, if you leave God out of the picture. But the reality I'm going to suggest to you is that God must be considered. The universe and mankind's existence within it cannot be explained without the supernatural power of a creator God. If you look at the opening verses of chapter 11, that's exactly what you find. Without faith, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, I better get in chapter 11. It, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The Old Testament patriarchs obtained a good report by faith. And we, because of faith, understand the world were framed by the word of God. And that he called it ex nihilio. He called it out of, into existence, out of nothing. Okay? Uh, you see, if you discard the supernatural, you have a real problem even coming up with anything remotely reasonable as to the existence of the created universe itself. Because, ladies and gentlemen, big bangs don't cause themselves. Evolutionary theory has to have a start, just like Christianity does. Christianity starts with the pre-existent God, that God always has been and always will be. Evolution, the world's uh, humanistic philosophies, really going to struggle uh, because they have no place to start. Uh, they try to suggest this and try to start that, but you know what caused the bang? If there was one, okay, that's the question that simply cannot be answered. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 1 puts it this way in verses 20 and following. The invisible things of him, of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. In other words, he says, just look out there. Look out there. You see mountains and rivers and suns and stars and, you know, it, uh, all of the things of the created world that we live in and the universe that our world is in. And it shouts that there was a creator. Okay? He said, and this, all you have to do is look at it. And you come to that conclusion. He said, they're without excuse when they refuse to acknowledge this. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And let me just mention, because the word will come up a couple more times, that the term fool doesn't really come across well as far as its accuracy in the English. Okay? We think of fools when we think of somebody just did something kind of dumb. Okay? No, the term fool means mentally aberrant, means mentally imbalanced. Okay? Uh, you know, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, the proverbial statement. And you could easily translate that, someone who is insane declares there is no God. Okay? That you're totally mentally imbalanced to come to that conclusion. You know, literally, it means to make into a simpleton. It means you're out of balance. You're not thinking rationally. Okay? Uh, the universe is shouting. Romans puts it this way. 
Hebrews puts it this way. The universe is shouting, there is a designer, there is a creator, there is a God. So the question really comes is, how can I please such a God? Now, as part of that creation, how do I, what must I do uh, in the, to find favor in the sight of the one, that's a capital O, than the one who gave me life? Here I am, I have life on this earth. You know, it comes, this earth is, it, in this place because there was a creator God. Uh, what is his design for me? What is the purpose of my being here? That great philosophical question once again. Uh, it tells us last week we looked at Abel in verse four, uh, dead men speak, right? And today we look at verses five and six. And I know he's going pretty slow, but boy, what a richness is here. We'll speed up when we get to the others. By the way, let me pause to point out there are a lot of different ways that you can preach in general, okay, with different type styles of presentation, with different amounts of material covered, and whether you're doing a synopsis, an overview, a summary, in-depth, exegesis, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but Hebrews 11 you also fits into that category. I'm pretty much doing it according to the individual that God has used as an example of a faith relationship. Yeah. So when we do able, we do able, whether it's four, one verse, four verses, or 14 verses. Uh, today we do Enoch, and I'm gonna go ahead and show you how verses five and six go together. By faith, that's the way these all start. You could almost uh, diagram the chapter by just going through and starting another heading with by faith. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. So this term translated has a lot to do with not seeing death. More on that as we come. He was not found, continued to not be found on this earth in physical form, because God had translated him. For before his translation, you kind of get the idea, God's using that same word over and over and over, so it must have significance. Before his translation, in other words, while he was still here physically on this earth, he had this testimony, he pleased God. Wow. Now we can sail through that in our do 600 verses every morning for our scripture reading thing and miss the significance. Verse 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. He doesn't say highly unlikely or there's a small chance. No, he says, no faith, no pleasing God. Okay. Four, he that comes to God must believe that he is. In other words, he must believe that God exists. And that, and second point, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay. This is what we're going to explore in the next few minutes as we take a look at it. Now, to introduce Enoch, he basically only mentioned twice in Scripture, one in the book of Jude, okay, where he's talked about being the seventh from Adam and the unjust men and ungodliness, and uh, that's the prophetical Enoch, okay? We have just covered that as much as I choose to cover that because that's not really the point. Uh, you know, I mean, it's worthwhile if you're doing prophecy or end times or eschatology and so forth. But as far as the content of Hebrews 11 is faith, not eschatology. Okay. And so we're going to go back to where we actually find Enoch in the primary role and just go ahead and turn back to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, of course, is the genealogical record of mankind uh, and how you trace that record all the way from Adam and Seth all the way down through until you get to Noah himself. That's a period of some 1,600 years of man's history, and it's condensed rather notably during this period. So let's, for the sake of time... Uh, we are not going to cover the whole chapter. Uh, we're going to look about the part that has to do with Enoch himself. Okay. Now, uh, verse 18, it says his father was a guy by the name of Jared. 
He was 162 when he had Enoch. Okay? Now, you think, wow, that's kind of old for a pop. But these people live 900 years. Uh, so, you know, frame it that way and won't get into the weeds too much. It, uh, and it says that he went on to live Jared, lived a total of 962 years, and he died. Now, Enoch, verse 21, lived 65 years, and he wound up fathering Methuselah. Methuselah, we, most of us recognize the name, has the distinction of having the longest recorded lifespan of any human being on earth. Out, you know, okay? It, uh, and it gives you, you can read it on your own and not even, it, 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 Bible, it, it, you get in verse 27, he said, lived to be 969 years. Wow, and uh, you know, that's a lot of pinochle parties. That, uh, it really is. Okay, let's go back to Enoch. Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had a bunch of other sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Fascinating passage, really is. Enoch walked with God, but God took him. Okay? In other words, he didn't, if you read through Genesis chapter 5, what you are talking about is the chapter of death. It's a text of death. Now, we look at it and we say, wow, this guy lived 969 years. He lived a long time. He died. And that's what you get after every one of these guys that's in, in verse 5. Adam lived 930 years and he died. Seth in verse 7, you know, he lived 912 years and he died. Enos lived 905 years and he died. And, and he died, and he died, and he died. You know, and it's like, wow, this is kind of morbid. You know, well, it's the way of all flesh. You know, and he died. X amount of years and he died. These guys just live longer than you and I do currently. Okay, and physically speaking, and he died. Okay, but that's not on Enoch's record. He just disappeared. He just left the earth because God took him. There's no and he died there. He is the really the serious anomaly. He is the exception to this whole pattern of men lived and then they died. Men lived and then they died. It, uh, God took him. Uh, the phrase means to be carried over or carried away. And he's obviously referring to physical death. I don't, you, you, it's the only conclusion you can come to. God carried him over the normal physical human process of dying. And he was just barely into the first flush of youth. I mean, he was 365. You know, and God whoop, took him out of here. You know, yeah, that, that's what it is. Now, just an aside, so we don't get too far out in the weeds here. Uh, many see Enoch as a type. Okay, look up here for a moment. Okay, you looking up here? Type. Type is spelled quotation mark, T-Y-P-E, quotation mark. All right, he's a type. You know, that is a way to express a figurative type of way to describe an individual or an event or a circumstance that actually predates the real intention that is still to come in the future. Okay. Right. Enoch was a type. Uh, and it's, he's referred to as a type of that it, what for the event, in this case, that we call the rapture of the church. Okay, the church is going to be translated at some point in the future. It's going to be carried over. There is a terminal generation of church age saints. Okay, maybe ours, maybe in a few years, maybe who knows, might be centuries yet. That's God's business that the church age saints of that final generation of the church are going to be translated. They're not going to physically die. They're going to be carried up, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, boom, gone. Along with those who have died in Christ, a whole subject in itself. 
That is not the point of Hebrews chapter five, verses, or chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. We're not talking about the rapture of the church. Okay, so don't, don't get too carried away with it. We're studying Hebrews, not 1 Thessalonians. Okay. The immediate question, I trust, is something to the effect of how could a man be so pleasing to God he was carried over or carried away from physical death? Yeah. And if you've got a little bit of Roger in you, you think, and why didn't that apply to these other guys? I mean, what about this guy? What about this guy? All these guys, and he died, and he died, and he died. Why didn't this being translated apply to Enos or Malahil you know, or Methuselah? You know, it didn't. It was just the one, the anomaly, the exception, Enoch himself. And the distinctive phrase that's in there, he walked with God. He pleased God. Depends upon your terminology, whether you're in the book of Hebrews or in the book of Genesis. Okay? Uh, the Enoch's testimony, he pleased God. In chapter 11, verse 5 of Hebrews, he pleased God. He walked. Had something to do with his obedience, didn't it? He walked with God. He had such a relationship. He didn't walk behind God. He didn't run trying to catch up with God. He wasn't trying to get ahead of God. He walked with God. Okay, that's the distinctive. Now, the verse 6 of Hebrews 11, the first part of verse 6, says, without faith it is impossible to please God. So their conclusion is that Enoch must have been a man of significant faith. He must have really oozed faith. Okay? because he had some stellar company as recorded in Genesis 5. Now, note just in passing, and that's it, that Satan's counterfeit is human works, human effort. God says, no, it's faith. Faith is the keynote. Faith, faith is what has to be that. Faith is my way of doing it. Human works is man's way. That's the religious effort. So, let's go back to... Hebrews chapter 11, if you're not already there. It, um, I'm sure I can find it. I left it right there in the New Testament. There it is. Hebrews chapter 11. And let's just drop down for a moment and look at verse 6 for some consideration. Because this is, we've been introduced to Enoch in verse 5. Now verse 6 gives us some operative principles as far as how does this faith thing actually fit. The, exa the example of Enoch's life. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. How do you, how do you, how does that fit into God existing and the purpose for your life and everything else? Well, we have been, as a culture, we've been inundated, uh, questionably, I'll be kind, uh, with the follow the science uh, terminology now for a number of years. Uh, mostly by people who don't follow the science. Uh, but anyway, that is what has been promoted. Uh, so that brings to mind for those of you that have actually applied logic and gone through some stuff, uh, the scientific method. You know, well, what is, you know, how, to prove the existence uh, of here, because it tells us in verse 6, that he that comes to God must believe that God exists. You remember with Moses when he was at the burning bush and he told Moses, God did from the burning bush, that I'm going to send you to Egypt, you know, to be a testimony for me and to get my people released from their bondage. And Moses says, listen, this, I don't know, I, what kind of authority is that? You know, I mean, what kind of credential am I going to take to Pharaoh, you know, to let, you know, a million people go. Uh, you know, how, how's that going to work? And God said, tell them I am sent you. And we look at that and we say, now that is a funny response. You know, tell them I am. The word I am in the Hebrew there means I exist. You know, in other words, I, what God was telling Moses to proclaim is 
I am the God that brought everything into existence. I am the ex nihilio, creator God. I am the all-powerful, the supreme authority in all the affairs of the universe, including man. Tell them I am sent you, okay? Uh, in this, see what I said, used in our physical universe, the scientific method, really, uh, and I'm gonna synopsize it a little bit, not get long and windy. Uh, it means it's what you are doing is observable and repeatable. You are examining something. You ask a question, and then you suggest a theory to answer that question. Then you conduct experiments, and then you change your theory to be in harmony with the, the observed results. Now, this is the big breakdown. Because of politics or finances or whatever, we already sometimes as human beings have a conclusion we want to head towards. So if the observable facts don't fit, you know, we just ignore the observable facts. We throw them out or just cherry pick the ones that we like, you know, to prove our point. You know, it, uh, selective suicide is what it is, but in any case, uh, that means that with the scientific method, you're looking at something that is observable and repeatable. If it worked this way one time, do it again. Does it work the same way? Or do you get different results? And then you adjust your theory to fit the facts that you've observed and are repeating. Okay. The problem now, ready for it? How many history majors we got? How many history minors we got? How many of you know what history means? <laughs> it, uh, all right, a couple of you, right? It, uh, history is the elk that you got last year. No, right? it, uh, The problem with historical facts is they can't be repeated. Did you know that? They can't be repeated. Napoleon cannot be repeated. Genghis Khan cannot be repeated. The assassination of Abraham Lincoln cannot be repeated. Okay? Uh, the crucifixion of Christ cannot be repeated. Can't do it. We have documentation. We have the history. You know, we have verbal support and so forth. But it can't be repeated. You know, Genghis Khan lived once. The assassination of, of Lincoln occurred once. You know, uh, it can't be repeated. But here's the thing. Just because something can't be repeated does not disprove the reality of it. Okay? You cannot apply the scientific method to everything. When somebody says, well, prove that Christ existed. Prove that Ronald Reagan existed. Now, yeah? you're going to take me and say, there's his, the tomb right there. There's his marker. That doesn't tell me he existed. That tells me there's a burial site with some bones in it, you know, that you think you can, like, so you put a mark. You get the idea uh, of what's going on, okay? Uh, can you put love in a test tube and make it a repeatable experiment to prove that love exists? How about anger? How about mercy? How about forgiveness? Kind of get the idea? Justice? Too bad we couldn't sometimes, we think. But, you know, by the scientific method, it won't work. Okay? It's, uh, it's, it's beyond what you can do. And just because by the scientific method you can't prove God's existence doesn't mean he doesn't exist. Just because you and I can't prove and have another creation event doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So the evidence, the first three verses of chapter 11, tying them back in to what we were talking about with Enoch, uh, goes this way, okay? I just suggest three things that mankind, and I think, needs to have some consideration. There's the law of cause and effect. If there are effects... You know, there must be a cause. If you have a result, something had to cause that. Seems like a no-brainer. Okay? You put a tack on the teacher's chair, you know, and the result is the teacher squealing and jumping into the air. Well, there was a cause and there was an effect. Okay? Uh, yeah. Uh, wind. 
Wind has effects, but you can't see the wind, but you can see the effects. Therefore, the effects prove that there is a cause that the leaves flutter, the dust swirls, you get the idea. Except for God, and God is an uncaused cause. He's the cause of everything, but he himself has no cause. Okay, confused yet? Good. It'll be something you can think about. Secondly, after the call, law of cause and effect, you have the law of entropy. This is called the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, it's the idea that as energy is used, we go towards a state of disorder within the physical world. Uh, there will be more chaos that results because, in effect, the universe is running down. Okay? If just left, it may be billions of years as human chronology works, but the universe as we know it is running out of gas. Okay? It's not creating you know, anything that isn't already in existence. Okay? Uh, third thing is the law of design. Einstein famously said that everywhere I look, I see design. And design requires a designer. Now, Einstein made no pretense of being Christian or having a biblical faith. Okay? But what it boils down to is chaos never winds up resulting in design. Okay? Uh, design has to have a designer. Yeah. I had a philosophy professor you know, when I minored to that in college a long time ago. And he said, he said can you prove the following? If you take a cage full of monkeys, put in a bunch of typewriters, and throw in an unlimited supply of typing paper, you know, won't they eventually wind up typing letter perfect the U.S. Constitution? And as a country boy, I said something rather vile under my, under my breath and thought that's about as, well, fill in the blank, uh, a conclusion as anything I've ever heard. You know, uh, monkeys don't produce U.S. constitutions. You know, uh, chaos does not somehow create order. It creates more chaos. Okay? It just works that way. It can't, can't be done. Okay? Uh, you know, so keep it in mind. And whether you're dealing with gravity or hydrology or magnetism, stuff that's in our created world, that stuff just didn't happen on its own out of the chaos of some big bang. And when you stop and think about it, it takes blind faith to believe in the evolutionary concept and theory. You know, where the Bible talks about, no, we had a creator God. You know, and a creator God designed it and put it into place and created it. Okay? The difference, okay? Science can neither prove, by the way, nor disprove God. Can't, science can't do it. But the evidence from the scientific method does result in the fact that there is a creator, a designer, and a sustainer. Otherwise, the whole place would just fly apart. Okay. Uh, you know, you know, do your physics sometime. It helps. Philosophically, by the way, the idea of God from human philosophy, the idea of God had to come from somewhere. Hmm? I know that you can wind up really out in the past the burrow pit out in the, the weeds way out there someplace on this. But, you know, stop and think about that as well. The Christian faith's working hypothesis is that God exists. That's its basic platform, okay, where it's going to go. So, is God a rewarder? How does that fit in? Because there are two of these things here that come up. Notice verse 6. It says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, four, number one, he that comes to God must believe that God exists. Two, that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay. Both of those have to be in place. That faith in God's being the creator God and the fact that God rewards both of those have to be in place. You cannot academically say, I believe that design requires a designer and claim to be of the Christian faith. Einstein did that. It doesn't work. Okay. 
I didn't claim Christian faith, but he you know, understood the design. Do what won't work that way. Okay. Both of these have to be present okay, in order to please God by faith. In other words, to have the requisite faith in order to please God, you have to have an understanding, a belief that says God exists, and then secondly, God rewards. Okay? The concept is a just and moral God rewards people that put their faith in him. Okay? David said to Solomon, his son, if you will seek God and let him find, and he will let you find him, but if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17. I love those who love me, and those who diligently seek will find me. Jesus in Luke 11, verse 10. Everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. To him who knows it shall be open. Okay? It is not enough just to believe that God exists. People also have to believe that God rewards those who seek him. Now, so what's the reward we're talking about? Well, on a foundational level and very concisely, salvation. That's face result when exercised. Okay, Salvation. John 3.16 Whoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. Or maybe Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Notice, seek ye. And all these things shall be added to you. James 1, 17. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of the lights of glory, with whom is neither changing nor variableness. Okay? All of these things are these gifts these provisions, these fulfilled promises of God come because when somebody seeks and somebody finds, okay? So every good thing which God has for the person of faith, including the starting point of eternal life, is included in faith's belief as a reward. It starts with eternal life, but how about forgiveness, heaven's love, mercy, joy, peace, okay? Everything is part of that reward. Now, it's interesting because there is no biblical record that Enoch in his 365 years on earth ever saw God or ever had any personal, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, type of event like Moses did on the mount or anything like that. But Enoch did believe that God was there and made his life choices in such a fashion that he pleased God, quote, end quote. Now, if you were fairly knowledgeable, you'll maybe have the question of, well, but how about Romans 3.11? There is none that seeks after God, okay? That is true, okay? But that's the unsaved man having no capacity to go after God, okay? He has no capacity. 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us the natural man understandeth not the things of the spiritual God. In fact, they are foolishness to him. There's that foolish word again. That you, 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 you Christian, you, you're, you're a bunch of nutcases. <laughs> you know? You really, you're a bunch of religious fanatics. You know? I mean, you could have slept in this morning. You could have gone bowling for crying out loud. Why would you go bowl? Yeah, I mean, you could go hunting, you know, or fishing, or take a nap, or, you know, eat extra potato chips so you die fat, you know, whatever it happens to be. It, uh, you know, but the unsaved man simply does not have the capacity. He looks at items of faith, the biblical record, and says it's just a bunch of religious nonsense, Okay. How then do men get saved since natural man does not seek? Well, it tells us that they are being drawn by God is as unsaved people by the ministry, or I should say the, what should I say, the pre-salvation ministry of the Holy Spirit. Okay? John 6, 44 says, No man can come to me except the Father who has sent me draw him. What is another? You know, okay, so what is involved in that drawing a, a an unsaved person who doesn't have the capacity to understand on his own 
Holy Spirit's ministry. Okay? If you read John 16, uh, beginning in verse 7, I guess it is, that's what my notes say, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it's necessary that I go away because if I go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world in respect of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Okay? That's a pre-salvation ministry. He's going to affect the unsaved world you know, in those three categorical areas. Okay? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Famous verses. By grace are you saved through faith. Wait a minute. By grace you're saved through faith? Yeah. It, uh, you know, it says faith, Romans 10, 17, bring it back to that. We've covered it before. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, faith comes through the hearing of God's word. That's why it's so critical that these kids get Awana verses every Thursday night. Because those are Bible verses. That's where God is speaking. Okay? And it is the word of God that does not return void. Okay? Again, you know, it, uh, everything that's involved in that. Yeah. It, uh, Enoch walked as we wrap up. Well, his testimony was that he pleased God. <laughs> Eurostatio, a Greek word that simply means to completely gratify to be totally pleasing, okay? Without faith, pleasing God is impossible. Not possible. Can't be done. No faith, no pleasing God. It's just that simple. So you've got really, on a practical basis, you've got the first step of faith walk. That's the positional when we trust in Christ. We trust in God's provision of the cross for our eternal salvation. That's the first step. But just like anything else, there's more to that. That's the ongoing walk of faith. Okay? And this is the active aspect of faith. This is Enoch. Okay? 300 years. It was interesting because, don't try to make too much of it, he was 65 years old and already a father before he began to walk with God in the sense that God showed, was shown the faith of Enoch. Okay. Now you can make much ado about that, start your own cult group, you know, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but somewhere in there, whether it was fatherhood or the aging process or something else that we have no record of or some combination, you know, Enoch, you know, really began to exercise a walk of faith. Okay? A, he practiced. It was an active thing. It really was. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We walk by faith, not by sight. That Dale brought our scripture reading this morning from that passage. We recognize that biblical faith and truth goes beyond what our physical senses can perceive. Okay? It, uh, otherwise, we could create every, we could do it all by just doing the scientific method. Galatians 5.16 says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Walking in the spirit, walking by faith, they're synonymous in the context. The operative power for a holy life requires needed choices to live according to biblical truth while you're in this world. I believe that's what Enoch did. He didn't have a whole lot of the Bible, you know, but he was working at pleasing God. He was working at walking with God and honoring God with his, and that's something that all of us are challenged to do. So Ephesians 5.1 says, walk worthy of the new eternal life you have been called into. An exhortation, a challenge, it's right there. Our ongoing existence our ongoing existence should be directed by our understanding of Christ granting us eternal life through his sacrifice. You know, Enoch walk with God. Here's maybe the goal we should look at. Enoch walk with God was so pleasing in God's sight that when he hit 365, he walked right off this earth and right into heaven itself. Pretty amazing stuff.
Let's pray. Father, thank you for the delight of being able to open your word and glean the richness that we find there. Perhaps not a lot of verses, but that's not really the point. It's being able to understand the truths and bring them into our hearts, into our minds, into our lives, into our decisions and our actions. And we praise you for that in Christ's name. Amen.